structures that are um, smaller than eight bytes in size or eight bytes in size. And the reason for that was purely a pragmatic one. Um, if you think of the large integer structure types, eight bytes used all over the place. If you start protecting large integers from a stack overflow, then you're going to add a huge number of cookies. So purely in terms of keep, keeping the number of cookies down, we kind of drew this artificial line at eight bytes. Um, and there's a couple of technical things in terms of if you're if you're a C++ class, you kind of look to like exactly like a struct to the compiler. So ideally, we want to protect the A and I struct, but we don't want to start protecting every C++ object. Um, and the main way we can distinguish that is if you've got um, a kind of a default construction, destructor that does nothing, then you're probably like the, the kind of A and I struct. If you've got a constructor defined, then you're probably a C++ object. So we'll protect the A and I structure type, but we won't protect stuff that's got complex constructors defined. So the A and I struct, a whole bunch of D words, that qualifies as made up of pure data um, and no elements of quantum type. So we ran this on a bunch of user code and um, kernel code, and the increase in number of GS predictive functions was reasonably modest between 2 and 5 percent. Um, it was still a little bit too high, and in particular we ran some um, benchmarks um, with the compiler team. And um, a couple of the benchmarks came back as, um, with kind of quite large variations in runtime. So this, this is where the kind of being smart about what we protect comes in. If you look at this function, then you can see that there's an array of fixed size declared on the stack, and there's a mem copy into that array of that same fixed size. So the compiler ought to be able to detect that um, and decide that that's completely safe. Um, but in practice, it didn't. So um, if we go... Visible? I don't know. Okay, so that's that simple example from that slide. Um, okay, so if I, if I compile um, that bit of code and we have a look at the assembly, you can see that there's a security cookie that's pushed on the stack um, and, and it's checked at the end of the function. Um, so that, that's really kind of non optimal. So one of the things that we have in Visual Studio 2010. Um, it was capability to, um, for handling that, that example. So if, if we use the Visual Studio 2010 um, example, and um, compile, no, no, we can find this file. Compiler, and you can see that if, um, if I compile that and then look at the um, look at the assembler that's that's been generated, there, there isn't any any cookie protection. That was the first the first step of things. Oh. That that was an obvious case of um, of efficiency saving that we could make. It's definitely safe. Um, the the other case was. There's lots and lots of examples of a buffer being declared on the stack, and then it just gets passed to a whole bunch of other functions. So in this example, you've got a parse data function down the bottom that calls fill buffer and passes in a, the stack buffer. And what fill buffer does is it takes that input and it copies data into it. So really what we want to do here is we want to analyze fill buffer. And when fill buffer is analyzed, we want to say, Okay, well, what fill buffer does is it takes its first parameter and and it writes the second parameter times two bytes to it. And that way, when we come to analyze parse data, when the compiler sees the call to fill buffer, they'll go, oh, what does fill buffer do to my buffer buffer? 
and they'll be able to look up the information from the analysis of um, fill buffer that has already occurred and say, oh, well, I know what that does. It writes the buffer, but it only writes the second parameter times two byte strips. And then you'll be able to work out whether that's safe or not. So, again, looking at... Um, so, I've got a debug prompt, just because that means I can get it to... This is kind of a, a check build of the compiler, which outputs extra information. So, this is um, the kind of similar code to what we had before. Um, the parse data. And... Okay, so there's a fill buffer that writes some number of bytes per its input parameter. And then I've got two functions. I've got a safe one that passes in the correct, um, the correct size of the fill buffer. And then I've got an unsafe one which is passing in um, too many bytes. So here, size of the buffer is going to be two times buff size. And then that would get multiplied by two again in the name copy and fill buffer, which would overflow the stack. So here we can we can analyze um, what goes on. So I'm going to compile that with the optimizations enabled. I'm going to enable tracing on the GS optimization so we can see what, what it's doing. The first thing it does is it's going to compile fill buffer. Um, and what it's saying here is that it's tracked the use of the parameter pbuff. So it's saying, I've, I've computed and saved off information about what fill buffer does to my first parameter pbuff. I'm then going to analyze parse data safe, um, and given I know what's happening to, to buffer in, um, in the fill buffer call, I'm able to say that this buffer um, buffer has been proven safe. And therefore, the function parse data safe doesn't need a GS cookie. Then I'm going to analyze the function parse data unsafe, um, and here it detects that the, um, the use of, of buffer is unsafe. Yeah, in that call. So the function still needs a GS cookie. And if we look at the, um, the assembler generated for, for that file, then you can see that's there. So here you can see fill buffer, which is just a function that takes a parameter. And then here we've got parse data safe, and you can see that there's no GS cookie here. 